Get ready to dive into a world where empires stand on the brink of war and terrible monsters tear at the fragile borderlands of men. The Adventurer Conqueror King System Imperial Imprint, or as we like to call it, Axe 2, is now live on Kickstarter. Axe 2 is the new edition of the acclaimed best-selling fantasy role-playing game. You'll find everything you need to enjoy epic fantasy campaigns with a sweeping scope. Whether you want to crawl through dungeons, experiment with alchemy, crossbreed monsters, run a merchant emporium, raise an undead legion, or even conquer an empire, Axe 2 supports your playstyle. Axe 2 integrates experience point mechanics, making campaign activities a seamless part of the core gameplay loop. Your character levels up in new and exciting ways each time you play, adding massive replayability to each of your adventures. Axe 2 offers 18 character classes, 378 spells, new combat mechanics, and so much more. Support Axe 2 on Kickstarter today. And welcome to Knocked Prone, a podcast of high crits, small fits, and varying wits. I am Cade, the host and game master of this Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition adventure, and I am joined here by the players to my left. Mason playing Look here. Brooklyn playing Litzy. Danny playing Tess. Caden playing Blink. Awesome. So as we last left our adventurers, they fought against some rats that had some putrid purple goo coming out of them. They were originally bunnies that turned into rats. Before that, they were all assigned into the gray aura, which is the first time that a aura other than the auras of the rainbow have come about since the beginning of Great Grumpopolis a hundred years ago. We left off with the players in the burned down church that Oleander assigned to them to be their home. So that's where we are right now. All right, so I think the, the next thing on the agenda, at least that I remember, is we were talking about going and checking out the rabbits because Blink wanted to do it, but I wanted oh. to do it somewhere else. The smell of smoke has kind of dissipated a little bit more. As You can't really tell if it's dissipated or if it's you guys have just gotten used to it at this point. The black sheep is still like munching on some of the hay that you guys fell asleep on. That's what you wake up to in this burnt church. Alright, sitting next to the sheep I'm going to start like pulling out the rabbits and start examining them. Okay. Uh, roll me a investigation check. 18. So as you look over these rabbits, they they seem like standard rabbits. There doesn't really seem like there's anything different about them. However, upon closer inspection, you do see that other than like the charred marks from Blink's fire blast and some of the cut marks that happened from your guys' blades and weapons hitting them, they uh, do have these small set of holes that kind of look like a necklace going around their entire neck. I just want to specifically like feel the tails, see if like it's an illusion that they're rabbits. See if, like, I can feel, like, a tail going out that's actually a rat tail. Yeah. You, like, trace your hand along their tail, and it seems to end right where the rabbit's tail ends. Piggybacking off of what he found, can I take a close look and see if the holes that are in there, if they seem like they were made by something natural so like are they jagged or does it seem like it was something that was like made by like a tool or magic yeah you can roll me a arcana eight you can't really decipher what where these holes came from okay are they still covered in that goop so when the rats died the purple goop kind of dissipated off of them and seeped through the cracks of great grumbopolis and it is now gone okay so we don't have any samples of this stuff Mm -mm. well seems like they're just rabbits you have those interesting marks. Maybe something that we want to uh, keep an eye out for as we continue our journey. Um, if we run into any more of the beasts, that is. It does seem like maybe we want to keep these rabbits nearby, possibly keep them in the church, which I'm sure you wouldn't mind, right, Tess? Should be fine. Have we already checked out this church? 
like done a thorough search as to anything weird going on in there? We only looked at, we were like looking for where the smoke came from and that was it. You can roll me an investigation check if you'd like. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, that's So that's a four. <laughs> <laughs> it seems pretty barren, like ruined paintings and hay bales. You don't sense anything too out of the ordinary. Okay. I believe our next order was to go back and see Oleander. Any objections? No. Sounds like a good idea. Let's do it. Do we still have the cow? <laughs> Oh, it disappeared. Oh, that one. Did like when, when you went to bed, when you woke up, the cow was no longer there. But you can pull an animal out of the bag of tricks I at any I'm time. I think I'm going to try that again, yeah. Just like while we're walking. If we're just like walking, just like... Go ahead and roll me a d8. It's a little late for breakfast, don't you think? A two. Okay, so your hand pulls into the bag and uh, like a little small ball of fur comes out. And it unravels into a young weasel. A young weasel. Mm-hmm. I'm just going to try to, like, put him on, like, my other shoulder, the one that my grasshopper is not, and see if he'll, like, latch on. Roll me an animal handling check. So that's a 10. It sits on your shoulder for a while, but, like, it hops back into, like, your bag after a moment, and it seems to want to stay warm. It's kind of, it's not cold, but it's morning chill. You guys walk to Oleander's castle. You pass by the statue that is being carved of him outside. My character looks to like look here before making any moves. I'll knock on the quarters for a second and then push open the door. Is anyone inside? Oleander is sitting behind a large desk made for horses. Okay. He's stamping things with his hoof, trying to get things in order for the 100-year festival coming up. Oleander, we took care of that thing you wanted. You said to come back. Has a day been enough time? By the time that you've left and come back, it's given me the time to think about what I think the four of you should do and, well... I have come up with something along the lines of your plans that you brought to me yesterday. You wanted to be the bridge to sealing together the outside world and this world. But like I said, I need to see that you can be a bridge before you can leave and go out to the outside world and show that you won't just die like all the rest of them have going out into the outside world. And so what I request of you is that you help four of the eight auras around Great Grambopolis in order to be allowed to do what you please as an aura, to be initiated. Sounds fine with me, and after this, I'm assured that we can be given some kind of uh, recognition for our um, abilities, talents, and newfound group. Of course. I think that we could definitely talk to Ted about building you something around the church that you're living in. Wonderful. I must say, that place is really not up to my standards, and the sooner that we can get that replaced, the better. I thought it looked kind of cozy, but I guess I'm up here in my ivory tower, so to speak. Indeed. (laughs) You are up there in an ivory tower. (laughs) Actually, I think it's rare jewels yeah, it is. <laughs> lining the walls. So are we are we not going to talk about the uh, the goop we saw coming out of these rat bunnies? Goop, Oleander says. Yes, uh, there was some goop coming out of those bunnies. <laughs> yeah, and um, it made them turn into rats. Oh, are you sure they weren't rats to begin with? After we killed them, they reverted to bunnies. We all feel quite certain about what we saw. No doubt about it. They were large rats. I'll have to make a a note of it here. And he, like, grabs a pen between his two hooves and, like, starts, like, (laughs) scribbling incoherently on a paper in front of him. (laughs) I always forget that he's a unicorn, not a centaur. And so, like, it goes from, like, half human, half horse doing normal things to just horse. (laughs) I'll look into it right away and I'll, I'll have my best men on the case. But until then, is there anything else you require of me? No. I don't believe so. I'm not sure how versed you were in your classes, but of course the eight auras are the red aura, or the crimson guard, the orange aura, better known as the shepherds, the yellow aura comprised of the healers and doctors, the light green aura of artificers and factory workers, Litzy, your dad's one of the best workers that they have in the factory. The dark green aura of the rangers and hunters. Blink, I'm assured that you are quite familiar with your upbringing 
the light blue aura of the town historians with you, Lakir, uh, that is where both of your parents hail from, the dark blue aura of the town wizards and magic users, and the purple aura of odds and ends workers and the town bards. And as long as you help out four of them, here, let me hand you a paper that they can each sign off on when you finish to let me know that you have helped out in a significant way. And he, like, fumbles on the table to grab a pen and writes in the most terrible handwriting good deeds on top of a paper holds it between his two hooves and holds to the four of you very well we will return to you as soon as we've completed all right i expect great things from the four of you i have seen lots of great things from your parents as well as your upbringers blink until we meet again i assume so for now while our main objective is to help the other auras is there going to be a way for us to have like sustained food and necessities uh yes i almost that way forgot we can focus on helping your mother tess actually uh left me a note here she said she would be stopping by the church that you were staying in later today she knows that tim your grasshopper needs lots of snacks so she said that yeah. she was going to drop off some snacks for tim that's good because i don't want to eat the big boy <laughs> Oleander, not knowing who you're talking about, just (laughs) not. Anyway, and I'll be like pulling on Tess a little bit, and he's just like, We appreciate your time, sir. Let us know if you have any updates for us, and I'll kind of like push you out the door a little bit. Yeah, as soon as the door closes, I look at everyone and take a deep breath and say, This has been the most directionless 24 hours I've ever experienced. Yes, really. You'd think that for such a rigid city that they would have learned to uh, iron things out over a hundred years. But I guess not even the surviving city of the apocalypse is perfect. I suppose not. Well, in any case, I think that the most fair thing to do is for each of us to vote for which aura we would like to assist. If there's four for each for us to do, then there's one for each of us to choose. I'm not necessarily saying that we have to split up, but we can always at least make our decisions that way. I personally choose the dark blue, the wizards. Green seems a little bit obvious to me, for sure. I would love to go back to the artifices. I'm going to take the red aura and go help them, go help the guard. Might be interesting. Well, I guess I should do orange. I know that they need some help. I don't really know what anybody else needs. <laughs> Well, I guess probably the quickest way to handle this is if we maybe all go as a respective emissary to our own auras, especially as we are probably the most familiar with them already, and see what it is that our troop can accomplish before meeting back up. Sounds good to me. Okay. Well, I'll see you back at the, uh, what should we call it? Church isn't really right. It's really more of just a smoking pile of rubble. Home sweet home, I would call it. I'll see you back at home. (laughs) (laughs) See you around, clowns. (laughs) (laughs) Well, my character starts skipping off towards his aura. And you might hear him, like, singing a little something or (laughs) talking to his grasshopper. I will start beelining it to the wizard tower. Tess, you will probably go last because you're probably the farthest away from the druids. Yeah, and I actually don't go there. I skip off and then I stop and I kind of look to come back. When it all splits off, I'm just going to kind of follow Blink and then catch up with him after like a couple seconds. All right, Tess, you turn around from skipping and follow Torin towards the Crimson Guard. Now let's join you in Torin as you enter into the Crimson Guard headquarters. As you approach the building, you see that it's comprised mainly of blood red brick and crimson paint and banners are all around the outside of the building. There seems to be quite the commotion inside as you hear the two swordsmen practicing sparring one another, as well as somebody in one of the jail cells clinking a tin cup against the iron bars. Yeah, at this point I'm like, I'll kind of like run over and be like, hey, I thought maybe we could do it together. That's fine. Just stay out of my way. Yeah, I'll stay right right behind you so I don't block your way. You stand in front of this big old double doors. You hear an elderly man's voice 
right inside the door as a goblin man opens the door. He's completely covered from the top of his head is spurting hair that goes all the way down to below his feet and kind of like trails behind him. He, you can't even see his features other than the fact that he's just this big mass of moppy goblin. He looks at the two of you as you're standing in front of him and he puts his hand behind his back and salutes. Salute him back. Welcome to the Crimson Guard. Oh, we, we met yesterday, didn't we? I'm Captain Fluffy Hands. You probably recognize me. Were you the two that helped me with my uh, rabbit problem? Ah, yes. That was us. Oh, well, thank you for that. Well, son, I could salute at you all day, but is there anything else I can do for you? Okay, I'm going to look at my card, and I'm going to look like front to back and see if it has anything written on it. Nope, just a regular piece of parchment with the words good deeds written on it in horse script. Mm, Okay, fantastic. Did Oleander send you here to help us? Is that yes, if we're here to see if we can help you with anything. Is there anything that you need done or anything we can assist with? Right, right. And he kind of like spins on his heels and walks quickly to the back of the room, expecting that you're going to be following him. In a big gesture, he throws all of his gerblin hair aside as he sits behind this big table in the back of the uh, room that you're in and starts scribbling on this big map of the entire of Great Grumbopolis like and he's like moving little flags from here to there and it kind of looks like he's creating some sort of war plan but it doesn't really look like there's actually a war going on he's just busily working on something so Hmm. okay and he sits down and he like gestures to the seats in front of him how many seats are there there's two okay I guess as we watch him kind of scurry off I'll kind of look at Tess giving him a weird look as to kind of say, wow, this guy's a weirdo, and um, nod my head to the side, like, saying, let's go in. I'm going to set Tim down, my little grasshopper, on one of the chairs, and then I'm going to stand next to it. (laughs) Okay. The captain, like, nods at you and yells, guards, another chair. And, like, somebody comes and brings you out a chair. So you have three chairs. It's kind of a little cramped, but he looks at you and he says, I don't know how to say this lightly, with the dragonborn around. He, like, kind of sidebars to (laughs) you. I get my face feels, like, super red. (laughs) The rangers, they've lost their minds. They think they can come and go whenever they please. Got to stop somewhere. We here at the Crimson Guard have always been in charge of the coming and going of the rangers out into the world for the hunt. But now they just think that they can go whenever they please. And we think that they have created a secret passageway in the ground. And this hole secretly letting them out. And he, like, looks back and forth to make sure that there aren't any rangers in sight. But then he looks at the two of you. He trains his squinted gerblin eyes at you, Blink. Do you know anything of a hole, Blink? I've seen no holes, and I don't know what you're talking about. You give me no choice but to take you at your word, and I like a man of his word. We'll keep you two around, I guess. What I would require of you, and if this is beyond your capabilities, please let me know. We want to set up a coup, a stakeout, if you will. Somebody will watch the rangers and see if they leave. And if they leave, then we'll bring it up to Oleander and have them reprimanded. So part of our task is to bring the auras together. And I don't know if the first thing we do should be to be working with them against each other. Is there a different option? That's what um, Tim was asking. There's no good relations in war, son. And this is war. You can tell that a combination of him losing his marbles and also a distaste for people who don't follow the rules make it so that he doesn't really want to help you out with finding a different solution. You want to control the rangers, basically. Yes and no. We've been assigned control over the rangers, but not control control. It would be nice, after all, if Oleander found that they were sneaking out and had to put some more difficult and strenuous laws on getting out of the city. And, you know, if he decided to take some of their funding away and give it to the Crimson Guard, well, we wouldn't complain about that at all. I don't want control, but I do want them to be controlled. I can't say I I fully agree in going behind the Rangers' back to do this, but if they are sneaking out, it might be good to know. That it would be. That is what I ask. I expect a full report. And he leaves you with that, standing up behind his desk, holding both of his arms tightly behind his back. 
I'm gonna stand up and I'm gonna say, yes, sir. And as I exhale out of my nostrils, I'm just gonna blow black smoke in his face. <laughs> he clicks his heels together when hearing you say, yes, sir, and like puff out his chest, he'll give out like a <coughs> as he breathes in the smoke and he's like, ah, dragonborn. <laughs> Sorry, he smokes and he's nervous. <laughs> I guess it's an involuntary response then. Well, take your leave then. And like gives you a very final salute. Yeah, I'll walk out, but like slower. Definitely like a little less energetic at this point. Yeah. What do you think? Are we are we away from the guards at this point? Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to kind of lean in to Tess a little bit and say, I think I have no intention of actually saying anything if we do find out that they're sneaking out. But if they're finding a way out and we have an opportunity to know where it is, this is our opportunity. I know there is a way out, but I don't want to tell them either. Then we agree. So maybe for now we could try to find a different aura. Well, at this point, if we're going to be watching them anyway, we'd probably have to wait until night. Mm-hmm. And it's the middle of the day now, yeah. if I remember right. Yeah. It's pretty early morning. Oh, early morning. Okay. We got plenty of time. Well, I will leave you, Tess and Torin, trying to figure out which of the auras you'd like to go visit next. But with that, let's go over to Lakir in the Wizard's Tower. Before I get there, I will use just the passive effect of my find familiar. It is a brown and red fox that is very cat-like in demeanor. It basically is hanging from my shoulders if it's not doing anything. It gives out passive chirps and yips whenever there's like loud noises or something that catches its attention. And its name will be Phoenix. Phoenix? Okay, cool. I will strut up to the door as confident looking as possible and just knock it or enter or whatever I need to do. Yeah. As you approach the wizard's tower, you see that it is connected pretty closely to Oleander's castle. It has like a long hallway connecting Oleander's castle to the rest of the tower. There's a plume of blue arcane smoke that's coming out of a chimney that's part of this tower. And there's some stained glass windows that create a picture of a blue book that has some arcane energy flowing around it in the center of this building. I'll kind of whisper down to Phoenix and just a little flashy, but not that that's bad. And walk in. So you walk in and there's this large foyer. It's just like a big open space with a few wizards pointing their wands at walls, practicing casting spells. But as you enter, you see to the left of you a big door swing open and the Grand Wizard will be exiting the experiment hall with a puff of steam that drenches her as she doffs her protective gear. And she smiles over at you and she she scurries under a table with her stubby gnomish legs as a shortcut to meet you and says, I thought I sensed a strong magical presence. How are you, Lakir? Thank you very much. I take that as the highest compliment. I'm doing well. What about yourself, madam? Dot. You can call me Grand Wizard Dot, or just Dot for short. Grand Wizard Dot. It mm. is very nice to meet you. I have looked outside of my father's home many a times to dream of this tower. It's wonderful to finally be inside. It's lovely to have a like-minded wizard like you yourself in here. I'll give her like just a a small smile and well, I will get right to business if you don't mind. As you know, yesterday we had several strange events that haven't happened in the history of our city. Me and a few of my compatriots have been put into a new subclass of aura, a gray aura. And while we have no set purpose or mission as of right now, we have been asked to assist the other auras. And so I decided to come here, offer my assistance, as well as propose something of my own, should you be so inclined. Right. The wizards, uh, we have a book that we are missing. I don't mean to speak ill of kin, but you know your, your dad? Mm. He and the other historians have thought that us wizards aren't really using their books as wisely as we could. Most of them are just studying up on people, but some of them have great magical properties about them. We want to be able to create great magic weapons here, but uh, they've restricted our access to that specific part of the library. To obtain said book and bring it back to us would be much appreciated. I might be able to work my way in. I do not know how accepting they will be if someone not of the same aura, but with my ties, we'll see what I can do. Speaking of weapons of destruction, magic and the like, I actually, and I will reach into 
my bag and pull out basically notes and loose leaf paper that I would have been able to scrounge basically from when I was a kid or from the books that had like extra pieces of paper in the libraries and stuff like that. And I'll say, I, I'm looking to create a spell, something simple, just a cantrip. However, I am in the need of funding and support. As you must know, magic is no cheap or um, inexpensive hobby. And as such, I have decided to come to you with an offer. If you would be willing to sponsor my efforts and my motivation to be to explore the arcane arts, perhaps I could share any helpful information that I find with you. And, of course, help you out with maybe any projects that you may have. I'll hand her the scraps of paper that I have. This is something simple that I've been drawing up over the past couple years um, from my fascination with magic. Take a look, and it's essentially the papers are equations and theories and different things like that that have been crossed out, and for the most part, it comes together to create a spell that is basically a miniature magic missile. In essence, I am needing enough gold and supplies, or not even gold, just supplies, to start experimenting, to at least understand what it is that I am creating. I already have some of the components, but if you have any spare paper or ink, uh, maybe a some powdered gem dust that's too much or not enough for an experiment that you just need to get off your hands, I would be more than happy to uh, take off your hands. So right as you give her your notes and papers, she pulls out like her little cheater glasses mm-hmm. that she has and she like pushes them up the bridge of her nose. She looks over them for a while and like her eyes narrow over certain passages that you've written and she's like, "'Tis a shame that your aura didn't shine blue. This is, these are quite the blueprints for a young adventurer as yourself. I think I could do that as long as you proved to be useful in our agreement here. And I, I, I could find, she says in like quotes, some supplies that we are no longer in need of for you. I'll give her a little smile and say, that would be most wonderful. And of course, any of my discoveries would be provided to you and the wizards for your use and benefit first. Quite peculiar. This book that you're going to get back for us, uh, it has lots of the same material that you're looking for. as lots of things, notes, equations, as you would, on uh, experimentation and creation of different magical properties in once used magical items. Just because I'd spent a majority of my childhood and life perusing the library, does that sound familiar to me at all? Have I read or heard of that book? does not. So there are certain parts of the library that had restricted access and that part of the library was mainly used for like wizards but now not even the wizards are getting the clearance for whatever reason to use those books. Okay. So I know that it is definitely not in our general area so it will take a little bit of finesse shall we say in order to extract this how about this we have a mutually beneficial deal upon us i get you the book if that gives you time to gather the supplies that i have requested and when we meet back up we can make a trade i'll have it brought up immediately i'll talk to my assistant all right Well, it has been wonderful talking to you, Dot, and I do hope that we can continue to work with each other. Likewise, I hope I see you again. Thank you, and I'll kind of take a look around the room again before going to find these guys. As you're exiting, you see various magical elements, like some uh, cauldrons and books and people like experimenting as different colors come out of their wands as they're casting similar spells. And you think of how great it would have been to have been selected for this aura. You would have been surrounded by other wizards trying to perfect their magic like you are, but instead, your father tried to make you into this fighter, and now you kind of resent him because you feel like it was his fault for the confusion that put you into the gray aura, and you feel this burning rage as you feel this fear of missing out on this wizard's factory and it's just one more thing that your father has ruined for you and that thought and pain kind of rings in your head as you go and meet up with the rest of the crew 
we'll go over to Litzy now. You are quite familiar with the light green aura of the artificers. Definitely. Having grown up there, there's like a huff puff coming from it as you approach it. You could just hear it like working and meshing of metal inside of the factory, which is made of like intricate metal and stone on the outside that are formed together to form this fire breathing monster of a factory. And like the heat of it can just be felt well outside the building from the immense amounts of work and combustion in the factory walls. I throw open the doors and say, I'm back as loud as I can (laughs) and start marching around the place like I've been there my whole life because I have. (laughs) And I think I'm going to look for my father if I can find him. Your father is kind of on the factory floor. He's in charge of assembly and pass off of these artificer magical items that are created as well as the heel bots. So he is kind of the check guy at the end of the factory line. You can see that he's fiddling right now in the back with this med pack that is connected to this heel bot and he's talking to the head of the artificer aura. Okay, so I see them. I know where to find them. Mm Mm-hmm. Okay, I had that direction. I approached them and, and just say, well, you're the two people that I would love to be seeing right now. I expect them. I kind of like look at them expectedly, kind of hoping that they're a little surprised that I'm here and happy that I'm here. Your father looks really surprised and gives you a hug. And he's like, I thought that you wouldn't be back here for a very long time. I'm glad to see that you're doing okay, champ. Well, I don't think I'm going to be here for very long, but I have been tasked to come here and see if there's anything I can help you with, any good deed that I could do. That's beyond me. I am Ted. And Ted looks over. Ted is the head architect, like, turns towards you, and as he turns toward you, he's, like, he's a human with this disheveled hair, and he has large spectacles adorning this crook in his huge schnoz, and he has umber brown skin that glistens with sweat as he wipes his brow and looks at you expectingly, and he says, well, you're looking to help, you said? Yes, absolutely. I believe that we do have just the thing for you here. He, like, walks o- waltzes over to you with his cool red cowboy boots that he's got going. He says, we have these blueprints designs for a new heel bot, but this uh, these blueprints were taken from us by, well, a, a crazy old man, and he's, I, I, you might have seen him around, he looks quite disheveled, he's not part of any of the auras, but he just kinda, he's a wanderer. Um, alright, well, that seems easy enough, so I just need to fetch those and bring those back to you? I, I'd be careful, he looks quite, does not seem to be quite the pleasant type. He came in here, guns a blazing, as he would, in a crazy crazy amount of word jumble salad he came up and stole the blueprints right off the table and ran out and said that we'd never see him again so if you could fetch those that'd be quite quite great by me this isn't a person i know right ted oh no no, i mean like this this guy super know him you've maybe seen him around but every time you see this crazy old man like people like kind of avert their eyes from him because he's just left his aura, abandoned his aura, and is kind of just a wanderer. Would you say that this man is criminal? As criminal as he can be in here in Great Grumbopolis without being outcast or banished for life. Would you say that it's appropriate for me to bring him back, as my friends would say, crispy? <laughs> <laughs> His what? 12-year-old daughter talking about murdering someone. Not Ted's, but I mean, my dad's right yeah, there. Your, dad, your dad's looking at you, and his whole face kind of turns bright red as you say that. Ted kind of looks over at your dad and looks back at you and is like, Well, I can't say that you could do that. All I can say is please bring those blueprints back in one piece. And I just say, well, that's all I need to know. Thank you. I just run off in the other direction before Uh, I have to say anything to my dad. Okay. (laughs) Let's go back to Tess and Blink. Which aura have you decided on going to next? So... We could either go to the orange one, which was the one I was going to do, or we could go look for another option as well. 
Nah, that's fine with me. Let's go to the orange one. So you make your way towards the shepherd's garden, which is the orange aura. It's kind of made out of like some sand stone, like it's super compact sand. And it is oozing out this mystical light from each of its windows. The smell of manure and freshly harvested wheat fills your noses as you both approach the door of this garden. I'm going to knock. Yeah. You knock, you hear on the inside, come on in, I guess. Okay, and I'll just barge in. Yeah, so as you walk in, you see lots of wheat and surrounded by water. And in the water is actually kelp that has grown. And they have many, like, birds and insects flying around. It seems like Tim would be quite in heaven here. Yeah, I'm going to kind of, like, hold on to Tim a little close so he doesn't, like, hop off and try to eat some of the stuff. You see a very short and stout woman. She looks on at you as you enter. She has these moss green eyes that her golden hair keeps getting in the way of, and she's a halfling who is very round in built and has an oval-shaped face and a silky pink complexion. And she approaches you as you swing the door open and walk in. Tess, what a pleasant surprise. Have you decided to join us yet? Not exactly. What can I do for the two of you? And she points to you, Blink, and to you, Tess. First of all, I'm Blink. Nice to meet you. Hello, Blink. My name is Grove Mother Mara. I do believe that Tess has told me a story or two about you. Hmm. Well, I kind of stick out around here. We've come to see if there's anything that we can help you with today. How very kind of you. It seems that fate has brought you here as we have just the thing. As you might have heard, we may have been not great about our allotment of coinage that we were supplied, and we may have overspent the amount of money that we were given to feed our pet rabbits and to grow our rabbit farm. And now, with the funding going out from us, we don't have enough money to complete our bunny rabbit farm. I have it on very good authority from one of the other aura leaders that there is big money in bunnies. We want to obtain that funding before the bards obtain the funding because, well, the bards would like to create an amphitheater in our beautiful, beautiful plot of land and they've already placed horrid stone where beautiful plants used to be. And she starts, like, getting a little emotional and then she, like, (sighs) calms herself. I know of a decanter of everlasting water that has been promised to us druids and our shepherds to keep our dreams alive by one of the bards who is in the shop down yonder. But I don't know if he'll give it to you freely. He did promise it to us, but you know how bards are with their broken promises. If you could go down to the shop and talk to the shopkeeper about the decanter of water and come back and we could strike up a deal on the money that we need. I think we could handle that. Okay. Also, one question. You don't happen to be missing any rabbits, do you? I do think that little John and Tink Tink and a few of their siblings have been missing for a day now. When she says Tink Tink, a little tear starts to come in my eye and I'm just like, (laughs) (laughs) Tink Tink. (laughs) These are are rabbits. Yep. Okay. If you do see them around, I have their monogrammed bonnets for them. I'll let you know. (laughs) I'm sure wherever they are, they're probably nice and warm. (laughs) Oh, good. You know, that morning chill is the worst. (laughs) (laughs) If there's anything else I can do for you, gentlemen. What was his name again? Who? The guy you wanted us to meet. The shopkeep? Yeah. I do not recall his name. He wanted to keep his note anonymous, seeing that he was helping us druids out. And he's a bard? And he's a bard, which I obviously, that. yeah, that we don't necessarily get along the best. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Can I take a little kale for Tim? Oh, take whatever you need. We have plenty here. Thank you. I'll get like a little piece of kale and give it to Tim, then set him back on my shoulder now that he's happy. 
Awesome. I go to the church. Yeah. Yeah, I, that's what well, I would assume as well. I would just be waiting outside. Link and Tess come back to the church and see Litzy and Lakir talking over what they've already... It took you a little bit longer because you went to two. They're talking over what they need to do. The four of you meet up again, and it seems that you have what you need. Welcome back. How went your meetings? Um... It was interesting. Very well for me. I think my task is pretty easy. So, What's your task? All we have to do is bring back some blueprints that a crazy old man has. Mm. And the good news is we can bring him back crispy. <laughs> all right. Well, mine is also fairly simple. All I have to do is a little subterfuge into my old territory. Inside there, I should be able to find a book that they have requested me to find. What about yourselves? We're trying to help the druids get funding. Crimson is a little more complicated. The guard wants us to spy on the rangers. So? Supposedly, the rangers have been sneaking out of the city through a hole or something. Interesting. Perhaps you could kill two birds with one stone. I am visiting the library to get the book. Perhaps I could talk to some of the seers and uh, see if they've been able to find any of the rangers going in and out of the city that way. If they did have a way out, I don't know if it's in our best interest to reveal that. Why not? Do you have some... You have feelings for the rangers? More so, I like having options. Very fair. But... We've already been given a uh, seemingly free pass out. All we have to do is finish these good deeds. After that, we should be home free from the boss himself. Me and Tim were talking about how the rangers also are allowed out, but had to find different ways to get out. Now that is a very good point. Very fair. Well, if you aren't too keen on helping them, perhaps we could use it to our advantage. What about blackmailing the rangers? And get them to sign it? <laughs> well, I was thinking a little bigger. If this did end up being something, perhaps it could be something to uh, buy their silence or allegiance at a later point. But we could help them now, as the saying goes, keep your friends close, but enemies closer. That seems a little bit evil, if I'm being honest, but there are clearly some benefits. What do you think, Blink, Tess? Let's sleep on it. <laughs> It's noon. <laughs> <laughs> I need to go feed big boy. And I'm going to like, my face is just red. And I'm just like, kind of walk off over and start like petting and like feeding the sheep. What about you? Where do you stand? It couldn't be more evil than setting what sounds like a homeless man on fire. <laughs> Precisely. That was one thing I did find a little interesting. Besides, I think it's a little silly that you're still fretting about good and evil. There's not so much that, only action and consequence. And if the consequence leads to something that you are after, why deny it? That's not a bad way of thinking. I can agree with that. And for the record, he is a criminal. A grey area, I think we, we can be sure. Granted, I do not claim to be a saint and have no worries about your morality either. I'm over there and I'm like, Gray, it's as dark as big boy. <laughs> well, I guess we can work on that. In any case, if we don't want to take the Crimson Guards offer, we will need to find some aura to help you come from the Rangers. So that makes a little bit more sense why you wouldn't want to do that. But I would say it'd probably be easiest to help one of the auras that we have an in for. One of you. Perhaps the rangers, if you want to use your connections to find us something to do. Otherwise, the clerics may be of assistance. They aren't too useful themselves, so I'm sure there are plenty of things we can do for them. I'll start, like, moseying back over when I hear clerics. They probably could use some help. And I need a healing potion for an experiment I'll be doing, so maybe this all just works out. Should we head over together as a group? At least it'll give us more options to think about over our midday snooze. Great. All right. <laughs> as you guys are heading towards the cleric's healer's hive, as it is known, that is where we're going to end this session. I am Cade, the host and game master of this Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition adventure, and I am joined here by the players. Mason, playing Lakir. Brooklyn, playing Litzy. Annie, playing Tess. Caden, playing Blank. 
If you like what you hear, go ahead and give us a podcast review or share this podcast with a friend. And be sure to be following our Twitter page, our Instagram page, and our TikTok page. Till then, I hope you guys have a great rest of your day. And when life knocks you flat on your back, all you got to do is keep...